Check, check. Is that okay? All right, good. Uh, it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to preach uh, multiple weeks in a row. And uh, as I was getting ready, I realized, wow, it, it's kind of nice because I was so excited to be here last week, I totally forgot my introduction to the book of Malachi. You know, we, I jumped right into verse 2, and then verse 1 was just kind of like forgotten. And uh, so we're going to go back, and it's not because this verse is not important that I forgot it. It is more I, I really just was excited to get into the other content with you guys last week. Um, as I was thinking about verse 1, though, uh, I think it, it could be a good way to start 2021. Uh, this is the verse. Uh, the oracle of the, war, uh, of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. All right, it seems simple enough, right? To set the stage, I have a movie poster, which can anyone tell me what movie this is from? <laughs> uh, that's an earlier one of his movies. Uh, this is actually from Left Behind, the 2014 version, which uh, I looked at the reviews. I guess I can say I'm very thankful I did not watch this movie. Um, unfortunately, though, I watched the original movie that this was based on, which was uh, Kirk Cameron, for those of you who are old enough, uh, from Growing Pains, one of the old, old sitcoms. Uh, I become Christian, and Left Behind was really popular during that time. So uh, in the spirit of fitting in, right, we watched the first Left Behind movie uh, with my pastor and my new church friends. Got to the end of the movie, and I was really, really confused. Because from my reading of the Bible at that point, I was like, what? People just disappear? Like, what is going on? Uh, but uh, being the proud, like, uh, science tech guy that I was, I didn't ask anybody. I didn't want them to think less of me as a new Christian. I just thought, if I keep reading the Bible, I will eventually figure it out, right? I mean... Reading the Bible is an intense uh, kind of thing, right? Many months, years later, I finally got to the end, and I said, what happened? I, I still don't know what these movies, these books are based on, right? Apparently, uh, modern translations of the passage that the movies, the books uh, refer to don't actually use the word rapture. I was reading through the Bible, waiting to come to this one word, rapture. Like, it would be uh, neon signs telling me, okay, now you're in, right? You know what's going on. I didn't, and I could have saved so much time if I simply got over myself and asked someone, right? This is confusing. Can you help me out? What is going on, All right? So as we start 2021... Uh, maybe this can be the year. And Malachi, what he's doing essentially in his book, in his prophecy, he's letting, um, it's not like, he's voicing what people are thinking inside, right? So what maybe we can do is we can voice those questions we've had for a very, very long time, or questions you may not realize you had in the first place. For example, uh, take the word, oracle. Right? Most of us would assume an oracle is a prediction about the future, right? But in the Bible, when we talk about oracle, it's not always about the future. What it's meant to be is God has given a word to someone to pass on to his people, right? It's not necessarily about the future. And the person who receives this oracle, uh, we call them a prophet, which leads us to the question, what does a prophet do, right? Are they like some kind of fortune teller, but Christian version or something like that, right? Uh, in the biblical sense, a prophet is simply the messenger. They get the message from God, they pass it on to his people. And it's in that message where sometimes there's a prediction about the future, 
Uh, and most of the time, it's God calling his people to reestablish their relationship with him. I don't know if you ever thought about these questions. Uh, I didn't. And then when I found out, oh, oracle, prophet, these are a little different than what we typically think. Right? 2021, maybe this is the year you can ask some of those questions you've always wanted to ask, but maybe you were uh, too embarrassed. You thought, oh, this could be too simple. I don't know. Uh, be bold, right? Ask those questions. All right. Uh, last week, uh, as we were looking at Malachi, uh, we saw that God wants his people to remember the many different ways he has loved them throughout history. Uh, we heard uh, from people who are, thank you so much for making my life easier, being willing to share. All right? We heard about technology enabling families to witness their children's marriage. We heard of individuals making it safely to their ministry destination. I think it was Cambodia, maybe? Okay. And then when they arrived, they were so blessed to find other people that spoke Chinese. Right? During these COVID times, having something familiar. Uh, you know, David is out somewhere in Taiwan, and uh, he told me that Wendy was fortunate enough, after I think checking something, they, they asked like, your mental, emotional state that was really low. And then they got a phone call from a lady with a British accent who happened to be on the same flight coming back to Taiwan from them, and there's something familiar to pass the time, right? Uh, we also heard how being in Taiwan as parents, many of you are so thankful that your children can go to school, right? And uh, one of the most encouraging ones, how adoption enables people to expand their families. I think those are the ones. Uh, hopefully, I didn't miss any. Um, if you have others, you know, feel free to share with your friends, family, uh, as we go on. So this week, uh, God's people have been reminded that God is good. He's loved them. And uh, one of the important things about remembering, uh, at least according to, to some scientific studies, when you experience something negative, the psychological effects seem... Uh, so much stronger than when you experience something positive. Uh, they even suggest uh, keeping in mind a ratio of five to one. So for every negative experience, you need to think of five positive things that have happened to offset, uh, well, I mean, you guys have experienced this before, right? Like, bad things happen and the effects linger, right? So uh, keep that in mind because God He's going to take an extended look at his people, their lives, the situation, and it's not going to be pretty. He is not happy. And uh, thinking about how God has loved us, I think, helps us to look at this as constructive criticism versus simply just a rebuke. And as we go through Malachi, it really does feel kind of like a rebuke. Right? So remember, um, when we take a look at Malachi today, verses 6 to 14, we will find that God wants his people to stay the course. And through these verses, I believe there are five behaviors here that will help us to stay the course. I think very apt as we go into 2021, a new start to the year. Behavior one, acknowledge what is right. Verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. Right? So uh, things are going to get a little ugly. Right? The language here is not so nice. But before we get into that, there is an assumption that God has made. He's made a statement of fact. Sons, honor your father. Uh, servants, honor your master. There is a sense that he expects people to know what is right. Children ought to respect their parents. Employees ought to respect their employers. 
right? Acknowledge what is right. The, the thing about being Christian or uh, knowing God, whether you're Jewish or, or Christian or not, is that God is the ultimate standard of what is right and wrong. When you know God, you're able to uh, distinguish what is right and wrong. When you don't know God, then it becomes all relative, right? You throw culture into the mix, upbringing, all that stuff, and it becomes, well, that's right for you, but that's not right for me, right? Who are you to impose on me your own experiences or whatnot? So uh, behavior one, acknowledge what is right. Only possible when you have a relationship with God. Behavior two, remember that you are not alone. We saw this in verse two. Uh, the people respond to God. They say, how have you loved us? Not how have you loved me? And in verse six again, how have we despised your name? Not how have I, but how have we? There is a communal aspect to having a relationship with God, which I think uh, if any of you have had to go through quarantine or have family outside of Taiwan, uh, that communal uh, strength is something that can really be a lifeline, especially as people are lonely a lot. So uh, these are kind of uh, cliche phrases, but I think uh, during these times, we can appreciate them a little more. Uh, stronger together. Strength in numbers. Two heads are better than one. Uh, in Taiwan, yi jia yi. Oh, sorry, my, that English accent. Yi jia yi da yi er, right? There's uh, one plus one is greater than two. There's something about being able to be in community that helps us. You are not alone. So over the last weeks, uh, I've been uh, able to catch the live streams, and it's been such an encouraging experience for me because uh, when coincidences happen, at least if you're a Christian, it, it's not really a coincidence, right? God is telling you something. So a couple weeks ago, Alex Wong was here representing Gideons, and uh, I actually ran into him many, many, many years ago on the bus coming back from Taoyuan Airport because uh, someone had messed up my visa. So on the bus, uh, we got talking, you know, told me about him being an electrical engineer, professor at uh, National Taiwan University. And as he was talking about his experience, can you guys guess what he told me about? Yes, definitely about Jesus. <laughs> his work with Gideon's and his work with Bible Study Fellowship. Many years later, he's here sharing with Grace about his work with Gideon's and his work with Bible Study Fellowship, right? Uh, Pastor Mark, he was with me at uh, the Pearl, and during that time, I found that he and his wife, Christine, have this passion for premarital counseling. Never in my time in Taiwan have I met anyone who just loved premarital counseling so much because it's so necessary. Uh, catching up with them here, uh, not only are they still doing this, but they've expanded their horizons and now they've tackled not just Taiwanese Taiwanese marriages, but cross-cultural marriages. And if you're in a cross-cultural marriage, you know, right, help is needed, right? Uh, I am one myself, right? So Pastor Mark and Christine. Uh, even small things like Mike Everett, he, uh, was it his daughter? I'm not sure. They went to see a movie, City of Angels, who I didn't realize it until I was thinking about my sermon today on the uh, MRT right over here, starred Nicolas Cage. And the photo I happen to have is of Nicolas Cage. Uh, I don't know Dan Long, his uh, preferences, uh, but maybe he has a thing for lists, right? He had that list of the top 10 most watched events in history. 
and I think Michael Jackson was number five. And then the British royals, for some reason, keep showing up, right? So, you know, there are people who have experienced things similar to you. Uh, there are people who have similar interests. You are not alone. Uh, even last week, I shared about my uh, housing situation, and unexpectedly, you know, people came up to me later and said, yeah, that's terrible. This is what happened to me, right? Uh, and if they can survive it, then we can survive it as well. Or uh, from time to time, uh, people ask you to share, how has God loved you? But I think all of us have experienced times when we don't really feel God's love, right? And when you know other people are going through these kinds of things, it helps you to be okay, right? I don't have to feel ashamed. I can be honest. Right now, God does not seem close. Right? You are not alone. Behavior number three. Be honest with yourself. Hey, uh, Malachi is voicing people's true concerns or their true thoughts because no way you would ever say to God when he says to you, I love you, how have you loved me, right? Like, God is God. We want to do that. But Malachi is uh, letting the inner voice out. So uh, God knows what's going on, and he calls out the people. They are deceiving themselves. Verse 6, uh, the Israelites say to God, How have we despised your name? God responds by offering polluted food on my altar. The Israelites come back with, how have we polluted you? And then God has the final word. Right? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Verse 8, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? And then God gets a little bit sarcastic present that, present those offerings to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. And then taking up another notch, verse 9, now entreat the favor of God. Come to me that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. And again, in verses 12 to 14, you profane it, my name, when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or is sick, and you bring it as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand? says the Lord. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Okay. All of that essentially say, if this is not good enough for your governor, how in the world is this going to be good enough for me? Be honest with yourselves. And as I was thinking about honesty, all right, we've all heard that honesty is the best policy. But I think we can probably say, through experience, is that really true, right? And uh, as I was looking for more scientific studies about honesty, I kept on finding not scientific studies on honesty, but scientific studies on why people lie. All right? There's so much stuff about why people lie. Lie to get more money, lie to get forward, lie to uh, not feel awkward. And then I found something about honesty. This is a professor at Wake Forest University. Uh, he teaches philosophy. His name is Christian B. Miller. Uh, I don't have a quote, but uh, from his experience, he says for the last 50 years, at least, there have been no studies about honesty. What encourages people to be honest? Why is honesty actually the best policy? 
But what he's found is when people ask what are important character traits you look for in people, they often put in honesty. Like, why is honesty so important? Uh, as a science type guy, I don't have an answer for you, and I haven't been able to find one myself. But I think uh, here we can probably say that honesty, being honest with yourself, is really important in order to take behavior number four, which is to get back on track. Now, uh, if you are okay, right, you know what God wants you to do, uh, you're doing what God wants you to do, then skip this, right? You are already on track. But when you look at Malachi, the people are not on track. So, verse 10. Oh, that there were one among you who had shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. Who would be brave enough, honest enough, to look at their lives and say, I am not right with God? And not only would they look at their lives, make changes, but then they would challenge the priests who are in power and in influence over the people. Who would do that? And that's where behavior five comes in. Only a person who keeps his, her eyes on the prize. Verse 11, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 14, for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. What's going on is God has revealed his ultimate goal. He wants not just the Israelites to know him, he wants people outside the borders of the country to have a relationship with him. That's the prize. But I think if we're being honest and someone tells you that this is your prize, this is what you get, satisfaction that God's name has uh, increased, his reputation is better, we would probably say, what's in it for me, right? Uh, so, uh, this is a different professor who has looked on at motivation for work. Uh, her name is Teresa M. Amabile, I think. Uh, business administration uh, professor at Harvard Business School. All right, so Harvard, God respect this. We found that of all the events that could make for a great day at work, the most important was making progress on meaningful work even a small step forward. And on the flip side, they also found a setback, on the other hand, meant the employee felt blocked in some way from making such progress. Setbacks stood out on the worst days at work. 2020, I think, was filled with many setbacks. Uh, for the Israelites during this time, before Nehemiah came, many, many, many years of frustration and setbacks. They probably didn't feel that life was meaningful. And I think that's the key to keeping our eyes on the prize, knowing that the work that we are part of is meaningful. And I think that, uh, thankfully, in a way, the timing, uh, we celebrated Advent, Christmas, Christ came, and he changes everything. After Christ, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, we're able to have a personal relationship with God. It's not just communal anymore, but individually we're able to approach God. And when you have experienced God in your life, it makes such a big change. And then you want other people to experience the same thing. I think that is what meaningful work means for us and how we can say that we can keep the eyes on the prize 
that we can say, yes, we want to work for God's reputation because that means lives will change. The people we care about will have their lives change. They'll be able to experience life more fully. Keep your eyes on the prize. Uh, the concepts here, I don't think, are terribly um, complicated, and so hopefully you can put them into practice as 2021 begins. Uh, from my understanding of Grace Church, unless things have changed, uh, staying the course should look something like this. Okay? Grace Church pursues God's gift of transforming grace in the power of the Holy Spirit for the reconciliation of the world through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you've been here with Pastor David, this should be familiar, right? We envision every believer as a disciple of Jesus prepared, equipped, and serving. We do that by exalting the Son of God, explaining the truth of God, expressing the love of God, enabling the servants of God. Now it's your turn, all right? Stay the course. Acknowledge what is right. Remember, you are not alone. Be honest with yourself. Get back on track as needed. Keep your eyes on the prize. Stay the course. Let's pray. Father, we are eagerly waiting for good news in 2021. 2020, uh, in many ways, has been, was a difficult year for many of us and many of the people, for many of the people that we care about. Knowing you uh, changes everything. Will we be able to experience that uh, on our own, individually, personally, as well as in community, uh, as we build friendships at Grace Church, as we uh, strengthen relationships with the people around us. Would your love shine through? Will we be able to see your love, acknowledge your love, experience your love, and know that uh, when trials come, that they are meant as a way to deepen our relationship with you, to know that you have our best interests in heart so that the nations, the people, can know you and experience your fullness, to have hope in these times, these troubled times. It's 2021. Help us to get a good start. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.